Um, I'm Kevin Boyle. I'm the area manager for Scotland for Wesleyan. Um, I'd just like to say a few words just before Stephen comes on and takes you through the details of the teachers' pension scheme on behalf of Wesleyan. So, on behalf of Wesleyan, first of all, I'm delighted to host our first teacher seminar in conjunction with the General Teaching Council. Um, we're really delighted to be able to offer you this service. As Kirsty says, it's um, challenging times for all of us, but we've managed to, to maintain and provide this essential service, even in these difficult times. Um, I'll just start with saying congratulations to everyone that's come on so far, uh, from a technology point of view, getting on, but also from starting to take a bit of advice. If you haven't taken financial advice before, or taking any control over your financial planning, congratulations today. You've started doing that, and that's part of the journey. Um, looking at a recent survey, actually, for the Pensions Advisory uh, Council, said that most people don't actually start even thinking seriously or taking advice about the pension to within 48 months of retirement. And yet, when people retire, the, the biggest bit of advice they would give others is get advice as early as you can. So, as I say, congratulations. Whatever stage you're at in your career journey, whether you're starting off or near that closer end, uh, well done for coming on board. So, what we'll do is we'll move on, Steve, and I'll just take you through what we're going to look at today in the, the short session. This is not one of our. Normally, we would normally come into schools and uh, and cover this in the school, but we've put together this slightly shorter version of what we're going to cover today. Many many of you may well have heard of Wesleyan before, but I appreciate that a lot of you won't. So let me just take a minute to to give you the highlights of the company that we work for. So. Wesleyan are not a new company. As it says there, we've been around over 175 years, in fact, nearly 180 now. I think Queen Victoria was on the throne when we first started. But we like to think we've improved and, um, and evolved over that time. We look after the, the, the line we use is we look after the trusted professionals that, uh, in society. So we look after um, doctors, dentists, lawyers. In our segment, we look after only education professionals. So that specialism there is really important to us. We don't try to be all things to all people. We specialise with uh, occupations, and Stephen and myself work with teachers. Uh, that's all we do. So it's no coincidence the team that I have in Scotland, where I have eight financial planners who cover from Elgin down to Dumfries, are all specialists in that area. Not only our knowledge, but I think our understanding and appreciation of your occupation. It's no coincidence that most of us are either married to teachers, um, have children teachers, or in some cases even been teachers ourselves. So it's really important to us that we do understand and we get you as far as that goes. So we have financial planners like Stephen today who can come and see you, or remotely talk to you and give you advice on that basis. Lastly, I'd just like to mention that mutual aspect there again. We're very proud of that. Wesleyan are a mutual organisation. In case you don't know what that means, it effectively means we we're not owned by shareholders. We're owned by our policyholders. The benefit to you is that means we can take the long-term view. We can invest for the future without having to worry about short-term returns. And that benefits our customers through long-term returns and being able to provide this type of service where we don't charge for doing seminars and providing that sort of information to yourself, such as today. Thanks, Steve. Just move on to the next slide. I'm being worked from behind by Stephen, who's using the slides today. <laughs> I want to change. Take you I won't take you through every one of these areas, but we are, Stephen is a financial advisor, my team are financial advisors. So, although we're bringing you up to speed and, and our specialisation is understanding your teacher's pension scheme, as I say, we are financial advisors. We can give you advice on every financial aspect. I won't say quite cradle to grave, but within there you can see we deal with newly qualified teachers, teachers working through their career right up and beyond retirement. And there's always touch points within your career that financial advice would help you, whether it's making sure you join the scheme, um, to making advancements within the scheme, to when you retire, making sure you're making the right decisions at retirement. And along the way, we can make sure that if things go wrong and you might not reach those uh, the goal that you're setting out, if something should happen, as, as does happen in life along the way, we can make sure that your family's protected along the way as well, whether that be arranging mortgages or looking after your protection, uh, we can do that as we go along. But Today is more about looking at your pension scheme. So, again, Steve, what I'm going to do now is just take you briefly through the agenda that we're going to look at today, and then I will pass you over. So, Steve's going to look briefly at um, the reality versus the expectation, what people hope to have in retirement, because it's not about the 
the gross pay anymore when you retire. It's about the pounds, shillings and pence that land in your bank account that maintains your standard of living. It is really important that you do understand there have been a number of changes Steve will take you through. And today, we will put you in a more informed position of what scheme you are a member of. It could be more than one, potentially, um, but it is important you get a starting point of where you are. There are other benefits built into the scheme as well, uh, such as death benefits, and we will take you that. And it is becoming ever more important that the interaction between what you receive from your state pension and when you get that and when you get your teacher's pension, how you understand when they both interact as well. We are often asked about early retirement, it might not surprise you. So we will take you through an example of uh, someone who might retire early and the implications of that as well. And right through, as you can see, I won't read them all, increasing your retirement income. Um, important at the end there, you may or may not have heard of this. There was a recent court case, in fact, it's still going on. You might have heard it as the McLeod case. Um, Steve will just touch on where we are with that and how Wesleyan can help you moving forward to make sure that you're kept informed if that happens. And last but not least, what do you need to do as we leave today? There is an opportunity to follow this up. Today will be fairly generic. Um, and obviously, we can't answer everyone's questions on a one to one basis. We will allow a bit of time at the end to answer a few questions. I will keep an eye on those as we go through. But it is important to say that as you go through, and you do, if you do want individual advice or more specific, there will be a link comes up that you can link on to, and one of the team will get in touch with you and can arrange a meeting such as a, an online meeting or a face to face when the time is right. To do that. So, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Steve, who will take you through the details of the, the teachers' pension scheme. Thanks for your time so far. Thanks, Kevin. I uh, hope you can hear me clearly enough. Um, uh, as Kevin said, my name is Stephen Balsilli. I'm a senior financial consultant with Wesleyan. Uh, I'll be taking you through the remainder of the slides. Uh, don't forget that you can uh, send questions through the app as well, uh, if you like. Um, so. First of all, let's have a look at what does retirement mean to you. So, as Kevin just said um, or, or indicated, uh, you know these slides are going to be fairly generic. Um, each individual will have different circumstances, so bear that in mind as we go through this one, especially. Um, so, when you're thinking about your retirement uh, and, and maybe starting to think about planning for it, there'll be lots of things that you'll need to think about, uh, and, and what the answers are will be different from person to person. You might be thinking who you want to spend your time with. Now, that can have financial implications because if you want to spend time with family but they don't live nearby, then you have to start planning for that kind of thing. Um, having a look at what you want to do in retirement, you might be looking for a fairly sedentary kind of lifestyle. You might be looking to spend a lot of money otherwise, um, or it might be a combination of the two. So, again, planning financially is going to make a bit of uh, a bit of sense there as well to make sure you have the right assets in place at the right time and enough income to do what you want to do. Um, where do you want to spend your time? You know, you might be looking to take a lot of holidays. You might be doing a lot of recreational stuff. Um, you might already have a holiday home somewhere, or you might be looking to buy one. So, all these things again, you need to make sure you've planned adequately for these to make sure they're going to be happening. When's the right time to retire? I probably spend as much time talking about that with with clients as anything, because um, you know everybody wants to know what's the optimum time to retire, or alternatively, how soon can they retire? Is is not uncommon. You won't be surprised to hear. Um, therefore, you know it's really important to have a look at the individual circumstances. So, um, the sooner you start planning for that and, and informing yourself in terms of what you might need to uh, when you retire in terms of income, you know what your expenditure is going to be, um, and then starting to match that up with what provision you have in place through the teacher's pension and other things, then the closer we'll get to the point where you can understand what's maybe the earliest you can retire and also what's the right time for you to retire. That one says, why are these things important? I'd like to think of it more a case of um, how important is each of these factors. You know, some of these things will be really, you know, you have certain things that are vital to you and other things that are nice to have. So it might be important to prioritise as you go through your planning and just try and work out what do you really have to have and what would be nice to have on top of that, the cherry on the cake, as it were. And how will you fund your lifestyle? Well, the good thing is you do have a good pension scheme there. The teacher's pension scheme is as good as anything, to be honest. But um, obviously, you may have other assets. Um, and, and likewise, you know there may even be debts when you retire. So there'll be things to take into account in terms of how you're going to find that income, the lump sums that you need, and so on. And there'll be things you can do while you're still working to influence that as well, which we'll come on to. Uh, we're going to put our first poll on the screen now. Um, you should be able to interact with that, hopefully. Um, as you can see there, is the average life expectancy of a teacher post retirement longer or shorter than the average person? Thank you. 
we'll give that a few more seconds. We'll see what you think. I hope hope you're all um, clicking on your choice. There's only two to choose from. Um, so I've just popped the um, results up there. So 55% of people have said longer and 45% have said shorter. Ah, OK, so we're pretty much half and half. It's interesting that um, something that used to circulate was, uh, I think, what really effectively is a bit of a myth, which is that teachers don't enjoy a, a lengthy retirement on, on average. Uh, I'm sure that's, you know, that can be the case with some individuals, of course, but um, actually you might be surprised to hear that it's a bit longer uh, than average. Um, the reason being, actually, there's been a lot of research done on this, um, uh, generally speaking. Uh, and one of the main drivers as to how good a lifestyle, uh, sorry, how long you live and how healthy you are in retirement is your income, it's your financial position. Um, that might not be entirely surprising. Um, and one of the good things about uh, the teacher's pension scheme is it does mean that the average teacher has better retirement provision than the average person. So it really is linked to finances. Uh, there we go. So um, it's a little bit of uh, research as well from the ONS just to do with life expectancy. This is not just teachers, by the way, this is just the general population. And the whole point in showing you this is that, it, you know, you might have quite a lengthy retirement to plan for. It's, it's not unfeasible now for your retirement to be longer than the number of years you actually worked, you know, because people do live to 100 and beyond. Uh, that's not uncommon nowadays. So to make sure you have adequate financial provision to enjoy a good retirement, especially the early years, perhaps, uh, I think is increasingly important, if not uh, at least as important as it always was. Um, so you can see there, somebody who's 50 at the moment can probably expect on average at least 30 more years of life. So how much money do you think you'll need versus what you actually receive? This this is a, an area that fascinates me because I've been speaking, I've been specialising in dealing with teachers now for about five years. Um, and I think there is an understandable fear that when you retire, there'll be a massive drop in income and, and potentially a big, big impact on your lifestyle. But if you actually think about teachers, you know, who have retired, you'll probably find that's not the case. Most of them are, uh, most of the ones I know uh, are enjoying a, a pretty nice retirement. Um, so some of the things that you might not instantly think about are your expenditure will probably in many areas or in some areas be less and when you're working, you'll be able to take your holidays outside the school holidays, so they'll be cheaper. If you have a mortgage now, you might not have a mortgage at that point. If you have dependent children just now, maybe they'll be independent by then. Um, so there's lots of things will change. Um, and also your income will go further than you think because you won't have any pension contribution coming from it. And you probably won't have any national insurance contributions coming off it either if it's just the pension um, that you have coming in. So really, income tax is likely to be your only deduction. So your income does spread a bit further than you might first think. Uh, one of the things that we can do as part of our planning with you is to, is to kind of work out, you know, what will be the net money that you'll have in retirement? Because the important thing, as Kevin mentioned before, is the bottom line. Uh, how much money will you actually receive every month as opposed to what is your gross pension figure, which is kind of hard to get your head around if you're not looking at that kind of thing every day. Uh, one of the things we'd encourage you to do is to, to, is to work on a sort of income and expenditure planner to try and start working out how much income and capital, I suppose, you might need at and in the first few years after retirement, because then you can start to get a feel for how much pension do you need, and then you can start to look at what's feasible. So that's something that your financial consultant at Wesleyan would be more than happy to go through with you and help you with that. Uh, another good thing for you to do, something I suggest you all do if you haven't done it already, is to have a look at the uh, your recent statement from SPPA for your pension scheme. Now, um, the 2020 statements were uploaded recently, but then taken down very quickly because there was a technical issue that meant there was quite a lot of errors, we believe. So I think they're still offline is when I last heard. Um, but the 2019 statement will give you enough information to be getting on with until the 2021s reappear. And again, if you if you are speaking to Wesleyan um, to get a bit of help with your financial planning and your retirement planning, um, that would be a really, really handy document to have, to have sourced by that stage so that we can have a look at that. Because one of the things we can do is we can put the details from that into um, a retirement estimate tool that we have, and we can start to give you an idea of what that might look like at retirement at whatever age you want us to have a look at. So that can be really handy. There's also some handy forums and things on the SPPA's website. But do bear in mind, SPPA haven't posted out statements for years, so you do have to log in in order to obtain your statement. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have noticed how much you pay, um, and it's not a small amount in, in many ways, because the, the legal minimum for uh, employees to pay 
towards their more the towards a pension these days is five percent uh, and typically you'll be paying 9.7 percent because the teacher's pay scale if you're at the top of the standard pay scale you'll be paying 9.7 percent of your salary so you know it's a fair whack we do appreciate that and um, the really good news is if you look to the bottom of this particular slide um your employer pays 23 percent of your salary equivalent towards your pension so although 9.7 isn't a small amount there's more than double that going in by your employer as well so they're effectively trebling your contribution and do remember your contributions made before tax too um, so it's a highly efficient and highly effective pension scheme there isn't really realistically anything else you can do with that money that would produce anything like the result it's going to produce for you so as much as it's been through changes um, it still remains an excellent scheme and well worth being a member of so we're going to move on and have a look at normal retirement age. Um, it's not always obvious what the normal retirement age is for or what it is. So we're going to cover that off in the next wee minute. Um, your normal retirement age, is it 60, 65 or state pension age? Well, in reality, it could be either of those or for many people, it will actually be a combination of those because you might be in more than one scheme. And I do have a slide coming up. Uh, the next slide, we're going to show you that anyway. Um, but the whole point in a normal pension age is that um, you know there's a way that they calculate what your pension is going to be and if you retire from the normal pension age or afterwards then that calculation sticks but if you choose to retire early before the normal pension age then they calculate what pension you've accrued but then they make a deduction uh, to reflect the fact that you've taken it early and the earlier you take it the bigger that deduction is um, so that's why there is a normal retirement age I hope it's doesn't need to be stated but you don't have to wait until that age to retire um, certainly I'm sure most of you will know teachers who have retired before they were 60 so it's probably self-evident but it's worth just mentioning um, this is the three different schemes uh, this particular slide now just going from left to right the scheme that, that many people um, who are listening will be in um, because if you were teaching prior to April 2007 you'll have been a member of this one and you, and you still will be um, it's a final salary scheme uh, it has a 180th accrual and what that means I mean that's jargon but basically it means you accrue 1 80th of your final salary for each full year of service so to put that into simple arithmetic if you retire with 20 years of service then 20 80th is equivalent to one quarter so you would retire on a quarter of your final salary uh, 40 year service would be 40 80th would be half salary and so on uh, it doesn't have to be whole years I do occasionally get asked that um, if it's so many years and some days the days count as well pro rata so you don't have to work till you've rounded it up just in case that's on your mind um, and the three times pension lump sum means, for example, if your pension is going to be 15,000 a year, then your lump sum will be three times that, so 45,000. And the normal pension age was 60 on that one. Moving on to the scheme in the middle, um, there's probably not too many people listening that are a member of this one, just because of the short time scale where you would be a member of it, but there might be some. Um, if you were already in the first scheme pre-April 2007, you won't be a member of this one. This one's only for people who joined from the 1st of April 2007, uh, but before the 1st of April 2015. Uh, if that's you, then you're a 60th accrual instead of an 80th, which uh, is actually a bit more generous. So you could retire on half salary uh, after 30 years service rather than on 40 in the previous example. Um, but of course, uh, it's more generous in that way, but there's a couple of disadvantages to it. First of all, there is no automatic lump sum, so that three times pension lump sum doesn't exist but you can manufacture a lump sum by giving up some of the income. And I've got an example coming up on that as well. Um, the normal retirement age also has gone up. So um, there would be a bigger reduction if you were to retire at the same age as maybe if you were in the previous scheme, because the normal retirement age is five years later at 65 for everybody. Um, if you were already in the first scheme, as I said, you won't be a member of that one. Um, but whether you were in the first scheme or the second scheme, you could be a member of the career average. And the way it's working now, um, I would think most people listening will be a member of that, their career average as well as the previous one. Uh, so you might have two schemes now, and if you don't already have two, you might be joining the career average scheme very soon. Um, the way that one works is quite different. It is not a final salary, of course. They do call it career average or CARE, C-A-R-E for short. And what that means is it's a 157th accrual, so it's marginally more generous than the previous version of the scheme. But what they're not doing is they're not counting your years and days of service and it is worth pointing that out because if you track your statements you will find that it stops counting your years of service when you move into that scheme so don't panic if your years and days are not going up now that's almost to be expected for most people now and um, what they do is they just accumulate pension income so you'll find the pension income figure under the care scheme goes up 
by a 57th of your salary each year. It actually goes up a little bit more than that because what they do is they revalue all your previous year's um, pension accruals and they increase them by inflation plus 1.6% every year. So it will be going up by a little bit more than a 57th in actual fact. Um, but just like the previous scheme, there is no automatic lump sum. And the normal retirement age could be 65, but for most people it's actually going to be higher because it's your state pension age. So you can see there's three distinct schemes there. It would be highly unlikely to be a member of all three. There are some circumstances where that's possible, but it's very, very rare. You'll be a member of either the first or second one, and then very possibly the third one as well. I fully anticipate questions on some of that, so feel free to submit questions through the app um, as we go. I've got another little poll here for you because I'm going to talk about state pension. It'd be really interesting to know what level of state pension you think is the maximum these days. Okay, so just sharing the results there. So we've got 15% think it's £96.20, 58% think it's £130.60, and 27% think it's £175.20. Oh, wow. That is, that is interesting. Um, well, I'm here to give you good news then in that case. It's actually C, £175.20 a week. Um, we do read a lot um, about the, the UK's state pension being one of the lowest uh, in Europe, and it is. But um, as you can see there, I think that makes us maybe think it's it's as bad as it could be. Um, but it is 175.20 a week at the moment, so a little bit more than most of you thought it was. Uh, move on to the next slide. Um, so we've moved on to what's called a flat rate pension. That's, it could be slightly misleading, misleading language. That. It doesn't mean we're all going to get the same pension because you do still have to qualify through your number of years national insurance contributions, but they used that term to reflect the fact that they ditched the old system, which was that you had a basic state pension and an additional state pension. Now, the additional part uh, previously was often called SERPs, and it went through one or two other name changes, but you might recognise that. Now, being a member of the teacher's pension scheme and a lot of other um, uh, occupational schemes as well uh, in the past meant you were automatically opted out of the SERPs part. So you were paying national insurance contributions towards what was the basic state pension, but not the top up, the additional state pension. And what that means is, I mean, it's not a bad thing in many ways because that national insurance contribution went to your teacher's pension instead. And of course, your teacher's pension is a lot more flexible, um, such as you can take it a lot sooner and you can get a lump sum from it, which you can't do with a state pension. So it's good news in many ways. But what it does mean is that some teachers are looking at a deficit uh, on that state pension compared to the maximum. Uh, and they may not, in some cases, automatically get to the maximum of 175.20 a week by the time they get to state pension age, unless they take action. So there are things you can do um, if that's the case. Uh, some people who are listening today will naturally get to that figure anyway without having to do anything. Um, some people will be eligible for credits. I won't go into detail on that, but it's something that if you are eligible to them and they've not been applied, then you should make sure they are applied. Um, you can make voluntary contributions. This is not something you would normally do while you're still employed, but in between your retirement date um, and when the state pension uh, happens later, you may have the opportunity to, to purchase some national insurance contributions uh, voluntarily. And the example we give there is that we have seen people purchase five years contributions. It's costing about £4,000, but you can see the level of income that it can produce. And therefore, compared to other things you can do with the money, you might look at that as very good value to top that up. And that gives you a guaranteed income for life. For putting that money in. It's not an investment as such because you would never see the lump sum again, but it does give you a significant boost to your income if that's what you're looking at. So just keep an eye on that. And as it does say there, um, uh, there's a gov.uk website where you can go on and check your national insurance record and it will give you a state pension forecast. Gone are the days where you have to fill out a paper form, send it off and wait a week or two to get your state pension forecast. If you log into that now, um, your state pension forecast is actually there waiting for you to go find it. And it's another thing I would suggest that you do before you speak to Wesleyan, uh, if you want to get some advice from us, because all of that information will help us to assess what your position is and what you need to do. So 
So we'll move on to early retirement. Um, another little quick poll. What percentage of teachers retire before their normal pension age? Which up until now has mostly been 60 for most retirees, but it is obviously moving up for the new schemes and younger teachers getting to retirement age. Okay, I'm just going to close that now. Um, so we've got 36% have said less than 30%, um, and 36% have also said between 30 to 50%, and 29% of people have said over 50%. That's a lot of percentages there. Yeah, okay, pretty equally split, but um, no, it's interesting. Again, uh, we maybe naturally have a slightly pessimistic view of these things, but but uh, but certainly by the latest figures that we have, um, it's just over 50%, around 52% of teachers are retiring before their normal retirement age. And I guess as, as normal retirement age goes up from 60, as it sort of traditionally was, to being 67, and you know, for younger teachers today, teachers who are below about the age of about maybe 43, 42 at the moment, it could even be 68 for them. So uh, I'm pretty sure not too many teachers are going to be keen or even prepared to work until they're 67 or 68. So that figure will probably go up over time as well. So early retirement is, has never been more um, pertinent than it is today. Um, this slide's just kind of summing up your early retirement options. Um, clearly, there's a lot of detail we'd set behind each of these examples, and we don't have the time in today's uh, platform to be looking into these in great detail, but I'll, I'll give you a quick overview. Um, actuarially adjusted benefits are already mentioned. So that's basically just saying you're taking early retirement um, there's a reduction will apply to your pension calculation depending on how early you're taking it. So the earlier, the bigger the reduction. Um, in my experience, the reduction itself doesn't tend to put people off. Um, it's more about the bottom line. So if your reduction is 10 or 15 or 20 percent, that's neither here nor there as long as the money that's coming in is enough to enable that retirement. That tends to be what's of overriding importance. Um, you can take pension benefits from age 55. That's what the circle on the left hand side is telling us. Um, premature retirement, uh, the best way for me to describe that really is that it's essentially a mixture of actuarially adjusted benefit uh, pension plus a form of redundancy um, by your employer. So in, in other words, although you're technically applying for an actuarially reduced pension, um, your employer is going to top up your pension benefits basically with a payment direct from them. Um, so that would maybe come along once if occasionally uh, if, if schools are merging or something like that and, and they're looking to reduce numbers. Um, phased retirement, uh, in my experience, is in increasing, um, uh, increasingly popular these days. What it enables you to do is you must reduce your working week or your income, certainly, which normally would mean reducing your working week by at least a day. 20% is the measure. Um, so if you're full time, you can go to 0.8. Interestingly, if you're already 0.8, you do have to go to 0.6 or below in order to qualify. Um, and then you're committed to that for at least a year. Um, and within that time, you're able to take your teacher's benefits, your teacher's pension benefits, up to 75% of them. So you could take 75% of your accrued pension and 75% of your accrued lump sum at that stage. So it can be a real game changer for people who are maybe at a stage where, you know, it would suit them perfectly to drop a day or two of their working week, but maybe financially it's not feasible for them just to do that without having some extra income from the pension scheme, um, or maybe they're old enough. So there isn't really a reduction to apply. So there is well taking some of the pension scheme if they're going part time. We've seen a few cases like that as well. But again, plenty of pitfalls with that. It's quite complex. Definitely worth speaking to Wesleyan when you're considering these sorts of things, because we've been over the course many, many times, and we do know the pitfalls um, and the little loopholes that you can sometimes take advantage of. So phased retirement, quick summary of it. You must have your employer's agreement. I mean, it's just like going part time, whether you're phased or not. Um, the employer has to be able to accommodate your reduced uh, hours or whatever. Um, your salary has to go down by at least 20%. You don't have to take 75% of the accrued pension. You can take less. Most people do take 75%, and there will be an actuarial reduction if you're not at the normal pension age by that stage. Um, but you can remain in the scheme, so you can continue to have a contribution taken from your salary, so you're still building up more pension for when you finally retire. 
Uh, for me, in a more interactive scenario, you know, if we were out in a school building in front of a group of teachers, this can be one of the most animated screens and the discussion can get quite detailed, uh, but today I'll keep it fairly uh, basic. Um, you will have a choice when you retire, whichever scheme you're in, to convert some of your income into lump sum. Uh, the example on the left hand side is based on the original scheme, the 80th accrual scheme, uh, final salary. So, um, you know, uh, with the other two schemes, there wouldn't be a lump sum on the left hand side of this graph, uh, this table. But actually, you still, the same thing applies. You can still convert some of the income into lump sum. So, the same concept would apply to all the schemes anyway. In this example, we're just supposing that somebody's uh, pension income is 17,500. So, the lump sum you might remember is three times that. So, it's 52,500. Uh, if that was your numbers, then the maximum you could convert to uh, to produce a bigger lump sum is 3,437. You'll see that figure on the right hand side uh, above the above the bars. What that does is it reduces the income to 14,063, but the lump sum jumps up from 52.5 to 93,749. Now there's lots of different things to take into account when deciding for yourself what's the right way to do it. So you probably would be well advised to get advice, especially because if you choose one option, and then later regret it, you can't change it. So it's a really important um, decision to get right first time. I would definitely stress that. Um, however, tax would be an obvious thing. If you're converting income, which is taxable, into a lump sum, and for every pound you give up in the income, you get £12 of lump sum, uh, you're normally converting income that would have been taxed into a lump sum that can't be taxed. So straight away, you're benefiting from tax benefits if you take a bigger lump sum, for example. Um, but you've also got to take into account things like cash flow. So are you going to need more lump sum early in retirement? Would that make a difference to your retirement plans or would it not? Is it more important to you to maximise the guaranteed income you're going to have? Or are there other, other factors? Because there can be a few other. The death benefits are different both ways as well. So it's definitely worth um, getting advice on that one when the time comes, because it's really important to get that decision right. It could make a huge difference to you either way. Um, clearly, you might want to increase your retirement income. That might be to help you retire a bit earlier than if you don't do that. Or it might just mean retiring at the same time, but having more uh, pension to enjoy life. Um, on the pension schemes uh, these days, you can buy additional pension. You can't buy added years anymore, um, but you can just buy additional pension. So effectively, you would decide how much more pension you want to buy, and you would have a, an amount of money coming off your salary to, to pay for it. Um, there are some serious downsides to doing it, but there are some advantages too. So again, I would seek advice if you're contemplating doing it because it can't really be undone normally. But one example of it is, of course, you'll remember back to the amount of contribution that your employer makes. They contribute twice as much as you do towards your retirement. But in actual fact, if you put additional pension in, uh, if you put a contribution in for additional pension, your employer doesn't match that at all. So you go from paying for about a third um, of the contribution to your pension to paying it all for any added bits that you, you buy. So in actual fact, the, the value for money of those contributions is a, is a fraction of what the value for money is with your normal contribution. So it's probably wise to look at other options, um, especially when you think that when you take that benefit, you might also have an actuarial reduction on it too. So it's probably worth looking at other things. AVCs um, are something that at times have been popular over the years. That's where money comes off your salary and it goes into a pension product with uh, Prudential. It's basically an investment type pension, but there's tax benefits to doing that and it can grow your money over the year, so it can be worth looking at too. There's other options which are probably a bit more flexible than those other, well, they are a lot more flexible than those other two. Personal pensions still give you tax relief, so there's tax benefits there and quite a flexible way of accessing the money these days because in 2015 the rules changed, uh, which I've got a slide on coming up just so you can see that. Um, ISAs are tax efficient areas to invest in. You get cash ones and stocks and shares ones. And then you get investment bonds and unit trusts. Um, Wesleyan can advise you on the right sort of course to go down when it comes to these things, um, especially just trying to make sure you've been as tax efficient as possible. You're sticking to what suits you in terms of risk levels and all the rest of it. And um, we can make sure you, you optimise what you're doing to get the most out of it that you possibly can. Uh, in 2015, pension flexibilities were introduced, which meant that uh, this is not relating to your teacher's pension, by the way. This is ABCs, personal pensions. Uh, stakeholders and similar things. Um, it used to be that when you got to retirement, you had to take an income from these. You'd be allowed to take a quarter of the money out tax free, but you always had to have an income. So in some people's cases, it would have made sense for them to stop paying into these things because it wasn't going to make enough difference to the income they were going to get um, after a certain point. But that's no longer the case. Um, 
these types of pensions are now very flexible. You can leave the pension pot untouched, so you don't have to take the money out straight away. You can you can just treat it as an investment for your future or your family's future. Um, you can take a guaranteed income for life as you always could do, but that's not so popular now, especially because annuity rates have dropped. So the income you get for the money is not as good as it once was anyway. Um, but the really important thing is you can now take flexible withdrawals from these kind of things. So whereas quite often pensions weren't used as an efficient investment before because there was too many strings attached, that has completely changed. And now it's a really tax efficient place to be investing money. So AVCs, personal pensions and the likes should be high on the list of things for considering. But again, you won't be an expert on that, but we are. So if it's something you need to have a look at, we'll be more than happy to help you with that. Um, I'm going to move on and have a look at uh, McLeod, which uh, Kevin mentioned at the start there, if you were if you were already on by the time we were doing the intros. Um, quick background to McLeod. Uh, public sector schemes were all reformed, or most of them were reformed back uh, around about 2015. So they largely moved away from final salary schemes into care career average. Now, to protect members close to retirement, they put transition protect protections in place. So those who were fairly close to retirement weren't moved into the care scheme. They were kept in the original scheme. People who were a bit younger than that were given a sort of transitional date. So they were told, well, we won't move you straight away, but you will move to the new scheme eventually. And then others, younger still, were moved into the new scheme straight away. And new starts all go into the new one. However, uh, in December 2018, Court of Appeal uh, ruled in favour um, of as a judicial and firefighter schemes raised this uh, down south, uh, where they said, well, because the way that you were treated by these schemes in terms of whether you were moved into the new scheme or not, and when you were moved, because that was down to your date of birth, it was ruled to be age discrimination, and that was upheld. Uh, and therefore, there's been work going on in the background ever since to put that right. Um, the big news with that is they didn't um, restrict that to the judicial and firefighter schemes. So it does affect your teacher schemes both in England, Scotland and elsewhere in the UK. So the consultation, believe it or not, is ongoing at the moment and it's due to come to a conclusion very, very shortly. Um, and then at some time between the middle of October and early next year, we're going to find out exactly what that means and how any uh, repair that they're going to have to make is going to be applied. So that is coming down the line. We don't have all the answers at the moment, but we do know a fair bit and we can kind of We've got an idea how, how it's going to work, but we don't have all the details, so we need to be careful about making too many assumptions. Uh, quick timeline, though. If you were already a member of the scheme before or by or by the 1st of April 2012, um, and you were still a member by the 1st of April 2015, then you're in scope. So it may be that you've been disadvantaged by the changes. As you can see on the timeline, December 2018 is when the court case concluded. July 2020, so just recently the consultation started. So after all the discussions with the unions and so on, um, the consultation began um, and we'll get the outcome of that very soon. Um, early next year, we expect to get detail about it. Um, and then from 2022 is when um, we'll start to see whatever they decide to do to correct the discrimination um, will start to be implemented. Uh, with this being a flowchart, I'm not going to go through it all verbally, but I'm going to leave it on the screen just for a minute so you can maybe follow through your own circumstances. So I'll stay quiet for a second while you, you get a chance to read through it quickly. I'm going to move on to actions and next steps, uh, and we're just about done for the slides, and then we'll open up to answer any questions that have come in. So if you do want to submit any questions, don't forget to do that. Um, they're getting monitored just now. Um, move on to actions and next steps then. So if you're maybe five to 10 years from retirement, it might be sensible to set a date, just so you've got something to aim towards. That date can move forwards or backwards as it needs to, but it's nice to have a target so you can start to do calculations towards that target and see what that tells you. Um, should be having a look at your retirement options, start having a think about whether you want to go part time before you retire or whatever, um, because you can start to build that into your assumptions if you've got a firm idea. Put a plan into action. It's better to plan uh, rather than just leave things to chance if you can. And that's certainly what Wesleyan's here to help with if you'll allow us. Um, you know, a plan is more likely to be delivered than uh, just leaving it to chance. Um, and put money aside to boost your benefits. I mean, there's almost an argument you can't put too much aside, but you could put too little aside. So if you can save, you should do. 
Uh, obviously, we can help advise you is the most optimum way to do it, but it definitely makes sense to put money aside. If you don't need it technically for retirement income, you could just use it to spend on nice stuff when you retire. So you can't put too much away in many ways. Um, and review your existing savings and investments. It's easy to overlook these things over the years, especially uh, in the last few years. Um, but you know, are your existing savings working hard enough for you? Are your investments still in the right things? You can get advice on that as well. We're more than happy to help with that. Uh, do seek advice and guidance for anything that's complex like that as well. Um, if you're very close to retirement, um, it might be time to decide what retirement is right for you. So is it phased retirement? Is it retiring outright? Is it maybe retiring outright but leaving yourselves open to uh, a bit of supply work or even a change of career for a few years and do something completely different? You need to start thinking that through. If you're that close to retirement, you need to know some things for definite. So you're going to need to know when and how to apply for your benefits. Now, Wesleyan advisors have been through this time and time again with loads of teachers, whereas you'll do it once. So make sure you contact us nearer that time and we'll take you through if you need it, what forms to do, how to do them, when to do them and so on, um, because we're quite familiar with that. Um, think about your options, how to take those benefits, whether you take the bigger lump sum or not, for example, and also need to start thinking about what you're going to do with the lump sum you are going to get. Um, that's where Wesleyan's really busy this time of year with retirees who have received their lump sum and they'll have allocated some of it to things that they want to spend money on, but some of it will have to be invested for the future so they can help with that. Uh, and look at your options for returning to work if that's something that's uh, on your agenda. Um, and make sure you make informed decisions. Uh, so um, you've been provided with a, a link to an inquiry form. So if you do want to uh, get in contact with Wesleyan, what would happen is if you just give us some of your contact details, if you're happy to do that, then we'll find out who your local consultant is based on where you stay. Um, and we'll make sure they get in touch with you for an initial discussion just to see how they can help. And you can decide between you whether you want to follow that up with a meeting, virtual, face to face or whatever it is at the right time anyway. Um, so make sure you let us know. Uh, we've got a, a very last little poll just um, as we sort of move on to starting to answer questions. Uh, hopefully a few questions have come in. Um, just to see what webinars you'd like us to deliver in the future, if you found this useful especially, because we do cover a lot of different areas. So really appreciate if you'd answer that one. And I think uh, it's time to hand over to any questions. So thanks for listening. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm back on now and I've just picked up. There has a couple of questions come in, um, which we can certainly pick up. Um, I think I can just about see them, Chris. If you could keep your eye just in case I, I miss it. But this, the, one of the first questions that came in was, if you're a member of the first and the third pension scheme and retire early, how will that work? Steve, I don't know if you want to. In the first and the third pence, yeah. That would be yeah. quite a common scenario now. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, effectively, the two schemes are separate. So if you're retiring early, so it depends what you mean by early, I suppose. If you're retiring early for the first scheme where the normal pension age is 60, for example, so let's say you're retiring 58, not an uncommon sort of age for people to be looking to do it, then they're both early. Um, you have to take both schemes if you're taking if you're taking one early, you have to take them both early. Uh, if you're taking the, the original scheme early, I should say, then you have to take them both at the same time. So you'd be committed to taking the original uh, final salary scheme and the care scheme at the same time. The calculations would be done for each, and the actuarial reduction that applies to the original scheme would be based on taking it two years early. And the other one, you could be taking it, say, uh, maybe eight or nine years early, so there'd be a bigger reduction on that. Um, if you're getting some advice from Wesley, and we can do a projection to any age you want us to, based on what's on your pension statement, we need that data, uh, and it tells you what the reduction is on each part of the pension and what the net uh, result of that is. So you get all that information on one page um, as a projection that we can do. It's a really good question. If you were taking, if you'd gone past the age of 60, um, so you were only taking the second scheme early, the care scheme early, that's different. You could, in many cases, defer taking the second scheme if you chose to. In my experience, people don't. Um, but it is something that you could consider doing if it suited your circumstances. Thanks for that, Steve. Um, yeah, again, I just reiterate that um, our starting point is normally you're getting a, the basis from the S, from the Scottish Public Pensions Agency. If you haven't done that already, as Steve says, go online and get that. But we've got our own calculators that work in conjunction with them. We can produce reports for you to show just how working both schemes together you know, in choosing certain ages and doing different examples, we can show you how that would affect you when you come to retire. Um, 
There's yeah, another question. One that a lot of people think, sorry, Kev, one that I think yeah. people find really handy is people who are thinking of working maybe a couple of years part time before they retire. I think that can sometimes worry people. It's going to have a big impact on their pension. We can show you a comparison and say, here's if you don't go part time, here's if you do. And it will give you that information that will make that choice a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah, and we can look at different ages, 59, 60, 61, and see what the difference would be. Um, sort of yeah, linked cool. to that, um, we've got a question. I assume you can phase but not take your pension early. Um, so we get asked quite a lot, um, can I retire early but do I need to take my pension? So no, you can, you can do that. You could leave the scheme and not take your pension, so you wouldn't have any actuarial or penalties on it. So you, absolutely, you could do that. But it's not always the right thing to do. I think you need to work out, you know, what would two years worth of pension be uh, mm -hmm. compared with my average life expectancy? Again, it's all quite personal. I don't know if you want to come in on that as well, Stephen, if there's anything else. Yeah, that, that's something I've been asked by a number of people in the past, Kevin, and and I have done I have done the projections for them to show them what happens if they leave it, what happens if they don't leave it. Um, and I think I can say without any correction that in every case, people have taken the pension straight away once they've seen the two sets of numbers. Um, in fact, at one case, I can remember of a lady who had deferred taking her pension. Uh, when we had the conversation, she was away applying for it straight away. Uh, once she'd actually seen what it would be if she took it now compared to leaving it for a year or two. So in my experience, although you can leave it, it's pretty uncommon that people would leave it until a later date. They'll probably take it as soon as they can when they see the numbers. I think I'd agree. I think that's all the ones that's come in, but I, I would like to raise one question myself that hasn't been asked there, but it's often asked when we go into schools, which is, um, how do I pay for this service, uh, or is it free? Um, so let me just be really upfront about that. As we said, being a mutual, we don't have to charge for everything we do. We're not charging for this today. We don't charge if we come into schools and do our talks. We take the long-term view that we're building relationships. However, we're not a charity. Um, and we do give the pension advice free. So if you want to follow this up with a one-to-one -one consultation, you won't be charged for that. Where, where the money does come in at some point is if we actually ended up, if the advice goes down the road, now it may well be the advice may be doing something in-house, which wouldn't involve a cost to us as well. But if there is a cost involved to Wesleyan, you would be, we'd be totally upfront about that. If it was a product that was a solution to your problem, before you ever made that decision, we would say to you, look, this is the cost. We don't charge a fee for it. It would be built in, generally built into the, the, the product or it's a, it's a small advice fee. So, for example, if it was £100 a month, it'd be £3 a month of that fee. But you would never do that without being in an informed position to, to know what that's costing. So, um, we, we tend to work with teachers for years and in some cases before it ever gets to that point of doing that. So, helping them, putting them in an informed position about their pension is the main thing that we do. So I just thought we'd be really upfront about that. I don't think there's any other questions. Kirsty, are you um, seeing anything else? Yeah, there's there's a few. I've also had some come in um, pre the webinar, just people um, oh, attending right. today who wanted to ask some questions. So there's one that came in via email earlier today, um, asking um, about transitions from old pension schemes to the care scheme. Um, so this person said, I believe members may be able to vote on which scheme they wish to follow. Um, and just looking for some advice on that. Okay. Um, it sounds well, like you're talking about the cloud thing. But, well, if it's the old, you're not allowed to vote on what scheme you join because that's just, it, it's um, it, whatever age you were, you to join that scheme. But they may be referring, as Steve mentioned, this court case that's, that we're still finding out more about. Um, so again, on a one-to-one -one basis, we could tell you whether you've been affected or whether you're, you're going to be due some form of redress on that um, from today. If you think you're going to be in that position, again, get in touch with us and we'll we'll look into that for you and find that out. I think that's what there's the questions around, Steve, would you agree? I think so. I think it's maybe, I would maybe just add, Kevin, that the whole point in this um, process, if it is McLeod they're referring to, I think it is, um, the whole point of it is to make sure that people who are in scope within that, that those years that are in scope um, are not disadvantaged by the change. So, you know, you shouldn't be fearful of the, the, the process that's coming down the line, whatever it is. It's designed to make sure that worst case scenario, you're no worse off than you are now. Yeah. Uh, and if you were disadvantaged by the changes, it's, it's to put that right. So either way, it, it's either good news or irrelevant news, but it can't be bad news. Uh, what we don't have yeah. at the moment is all the detail around how it's all going to be fixed. So we can kind of speculate a little bit, but we'd much rather wait until we have the information, then we can communicate that properly. 
maybe take one more if there's one, Kirsty, and then we'll kind of, I'm conscious of yeah, time. Uh, yeah, um, we've, we've still got um, about 10 minutes before the advertised. Right, okay. Um, okay. So I've actually just noticed a couple of questions that I think are linked from a few different people. So someone, um, basically it's about retiring and, and the options um, of taking a pension before 50, age of 55. So someone's asking, can you take ABC cash lump sum at 55 without retiring? Um, and someone's asking if there's a way to take the pension before 55. Okay. So the 55 age for um, Dave, you want to? Well, 55 is a regulatory minimum, so it applies to every pension. Um, the only exceptions to that ever would be things like ill health retirement pension. You know, if you've been pensioned off through ill health before then, then it can sometimes be possible. But, but ultimately, 55 is a minimum uh, for everything. Yeah, now, interestingly, your ABC and your teacher's pension are separate. Yeah, yeah, that's going to rise actually. Yeah, it is. Uh, if they yeah. if they put that through, uh, they're 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 expecting to raise that minimum age to fifty seven two thousand twenty eight. I think it is. So yeah. um, you know that's a moving feast as well. So keep an eye on that uh, as it changes. But it's down to a regulation that says that pension schemes can't be accessed before you're fifty five. But because your ABC and your teacher's pension are technically separate, you don't have to take them at the same time. So they can be taken at different times. Um, plenty of people retire and take their teacher's pension and find that whilst they saved into the ABC. You know, over the years, maybe years ago, they saved into it thinking, I'm going to need this so I can retire when I want to. When they get to that point where they are retiring, they don't need it. Uh, and therefore, they can just treat it like an investment that they can maybe draw a lump sum out of, or they can just keep it invested for a rainy day. Um, so it is it's sometimes good to have more than just the teacher's pension uh, and have something else that you can sort of treat as a flexible pot and take at a different time. Um, but there, you have to be a teacher to be in the ABC scheme, but it's not really linked to your teacher's pension in any other way on any level? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, actually. We very often now find, as Steve says, a teacher retiring, but she's got that or he's got that AVC pot. There's often a gap between when they retire. So let's say they're going at 61, 62, and the state pension's not coming in at 67. They know when the state pension's coming in, they'll be quite comfortably off. But how do they, how do they breach the gap from 61 or 62 to 67? That's when some sort of external pot, like your AVC pot or a personal pot, you can take that over a seven or eight year period. You don't now have to buy what you used to call an annuity, which is a fixed income for life, which looked pretty small. And people would say, oh, it's only £100 a month for life. It's not very much. But you could you could convert that into an investment and take three, £400 a month, but spend it all over over seven or eight or ten years. Don't want to get into too detail, but yeah, that is an option to use that pot to bridge the gap between retiring early and getting to your state pension age. Then you'll have further income coming in at that point. So again, there are options with that within that to speak to us. Um, someone was just asking Any about um, how, to, how to contact you guys. Um, so the link should be available somewhere within the um, control panel, but um, there is a, a follow-up email um, that will go out after the webinar finishes, which has this link in it as well. So just if anybody needs to get in touch um, after the webinar, that should be there. Yeah, that's. That's a good point. The, the link that's on the chat box, I can see it. Um, it goes to my colleague, uh, Cathy. Um, now, Cathy, when she receives your details, she'll have a look at your postcode and then she'll be able to go into our system and see who your local appointed uh, financial consultant is. So wherever you are in Scotland, you'll have somebody who covers that territory, that, that postcode, uh, and then it'll be that individual um, who will get in touch with you to see how they can help. Um. So we do we do still have a few Anyone? questions here. Um if you guys are, are happy to the potato's answer. Um I'm up for it. We've got five minutes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um just trying to pick uh, which one to start with. Um so someone's saying as a forty five year new entrant to the scheme, what's the best way to boost retirement income? Faster accrual, additional additional pensions or ABCs. Forty five year old, did you say? But a new entrant? Yeah. Um, well, that's one of that's one of those areas where I'd be careful what I say because I would need you know as an advisor I would need to understand more about your circumstances. Um, we need to have a look at the holistic picture. You know, do you have debt? What debts do you have? What commitments do you have? Do you have family, uh, independence, um, income streams, expenditure? All of that's going to make a big difference. Uh, your current salary, tax levels, and things like that because there's so many different things that you could do to save that we need to go through 
a robust process to then get at the end of that process, get to the point and say, well, in your case, this is how you should save that money. This ticks more boxes than anything else, because that's what it's all about. Um, tax efficiency would be high on the list, so we'd certainly consider pensions first of all. But for somebody who's 45, sometimes a pension doesn't suit, because remember, you can't touch the money till you're 55. So occasionally somebody who's wanting to save for retirement and they're 45, they might say, yeah, but I still want to have the get out clause that if I need that money earlier, I can have it. So then we'd move on to things like ISAs and unit trusts uh, and investment bonds and things like that. So I can't answer it as a blanket answer that would apply to everybody, because if, if the same answer applied to everybody, I wouldn't have a job. Uh, advisors are there because everybody's circumstances are different. And therefore, each individual needs to think about all the different factors for them to come up with the right answer. But that's why we're here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so someone is asking um, what the benefits are for the family um, on death of the teacher at retiring age. It changes depending whether you're retired or not, and it's also different depending on which scheme you're in. So again, you know, probably not the environment to be listing off all the different benefits that are there, but more generically, while you're still working, um, there's a spouse's benefit if you have a spouse, um, a civil partner or a nominated partner now. And, and if there's people on who, who uh, have a life partner, but you're not a civil partner or, or married, then there's a form on the SPP's website that you'd be well advised to, to fill in because you can have a legal nomination and say, well, we're not married, but this is my partner to make sure they're recognised uh, by the scheme. Uh, and they, therefore, they would benefit in the event of your death. Um, there's a lump sum payable, three times your salary. One that catches a lot of people out is that it's three times the full-time equivalent salary. So if you're part-time, it's still three times the full-time equivalent salary that pays out on death. Uh, there would be a, a, a sort of widow's pension, if you like, a survivor's pension and for dependent children uh, up to the age of 23 if they're in full-time education or up to the age of 18. So those are all the benefits when you're working. Uh, when you're retired, it does depend on which scheme you were in when you retired, so it does depend. Um, but certainly when you're retired, there's a survivor's pension at least, uh, assuming you have a spouse. Now that's quite a, that can be a contentious one because if there isn't a spouse or a, or a recognised partner, there would be nothing we'd pay out after your death when you're retired normally. Um, but if there is a partner, then they would normally get half of what your pension would have been. Yeah. And that death that service of three times salary, we often get asked, believe it or not, do you have to be in the classroom when you die? No, you get, that gets paid out whether you're at school or, or at home. So don't worry about that, as long as you're a teacher. Um, we've only got three Absolutely. questions left. I know, I, know it's, um, I know it's five now, but we do only have three questions left. Um, if you're happy to, to answer them. Um, I'll stay on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so someone has said, if my MPA is listed as 60, does this apply to both schemes? No, it'll apply to the final salary scheme. So if you've moved into the care scheme, that'll be uh, whatever your state pension age is, typically 67 for most people I speak to, but it could be 66 or 68, even depending on your age. Um, but you can take the benefits you know, you can still take them early, you can still take them after 60, you can take them both. Um, by and large, people will take them both at the same time, and they just have to accept that the actuarial reduction will apply to the care scheme, at least, if it doesn't, even if it doesn't apply to the other one. Um, but as I said before, um, it doesn't sound nice having an actuarial reduction, you know, it, but it's a necessity for the scheme. The scheme wouldn't work if there wasn't a sort of an age where they say, you know, the, the, the figures only really work from that age onwards, so it has to happen. Um, but I don't find it puts people off. People tend to just, you know, once they've seen the bottom line and said, okay, if that's what I'm going to have at that stage, that's enough for me to retire on. So let's talk about um, what we can do to get me retired at that point. Um, but yeah, you, you will have two normal pension ages in effect, is the short answer. Um, on the first scheme, if you work beyond 60, do you still get the benefits of that scheme? Yeah, uh, that's quite a good one. I mean, effectively, when they move you onto the care scheme, your benefits under the original scheme are ring fenced, they're protected. So if you've transitioned across from uh, final salary to, to normal uh, to the care scheme, then if you had 25 year service under the final salary scheme, you retain 25 year service. It'll still be based on your final salary just before you retire. Um, 
So you'll end up with two sets of benefits uh, on your statement forevermore until you retire, and then your pension will be calculated based on uh, a calculation of your final salary scheme plus a calculation of your care scheme, and then add the two sets of benefits together. That gives you your pension. It will. I know it sounds a bit complicated. If we were to produce a pension forecast for you, what it does is it splits them out, and it shows you what the bottom line is, but it also shows you how much of that income is coming from the final salary scheme. What is the actuarial reduction if there is one? How much of that is coming from the care scheme? And lump sum as well, how much is coming from each scheme? And it does the calculation for you. It shows you the actuarial reduction on each. It gives you the bottom line, and it also compares the normal pension, which is basically equivalent to what your statement's telling you, with the enhanced lump sum example. So it's all on one page, uh, uh, and it gives you all of that information at a glance, which is great. If I could just come in there, Steve. What, I'm sure you've seen this, Steve, where we get teachers who are actually working beyond 60, and they've got the majority of the scheme in the old scheme and the 60 scheme, but they don't realise, and they want, to, they want to kind of give up a bit of their work, but think they can't afford to, they've got to work to the full age. But actually, if they've got most of it in the old scheme, they could, they could part retire, pay retirement, there's no penalties or deductions on the old scheme, and go part-time, and, and they're often better off going part-time than they would be working full-time, because they can get access with no penalties to the, to the old scheme. Yeah, I would say as a rule of thumb, although it depends on circumstances, if you had, say, let's say about 25 years service in the final salary scheme, um, and you were to take three quarters of your benefits on phased, you could probably go down to about 0.6 uh, working pattern, and your take home monies would be broadly what it was when you were full time. So it's been a game changer sometimes. You know, when I say sometimes, I mean quite often going through figures with teachers and saying, right, let's look at phased, let's see what that would produce for you. Um, and it genuinely has gotten quite a few people rather excited, thinking actually I could have the same take home money from now, um, working three days instead of five days, and my eventual pension will be almost as much as it would have been if I hadn't done this. You know, it doesn't really have a have a profound impact on the pension you eventually get when you do retire. So it's definitely worth a look. Um, I'll just take one last question, as there's been two that come in that are very similar, um, and then finish up. I know there are still some questions here, but we're able to take them um, and answer them on an individual basis. Um, so people are just asking sure. about um, death benefit death benefits in relation to adult children um, if if you don't have a partner. So would would the the, ch the children receive a lump sum or payment um, if if they if they passed away and then didn't have a, a partner. Uh, that was breaking up quite a lot for me, Kevin. So I don't know if you heard it. You can answer it if you did. I, I, yeah, I didn't quite get it all either. But I think it was in relation to obviously the children's pensions. If something happened to the member. So I'll, I'll give you an answer. I'm, yeah. To, to yeah. Um, Steve, children's sorry. pensions. So generally, yeah. Sorry, Kirsty. Sorry, I, I do have a bit of a, a bad connection. Apologies. Um, yeah, it was just in relation to um, so if a, a member of the scheme, if they had passed away, but they didn't have a, either a surviving partner or they didn't have a partner at all, would their children then receive that lump sum? Yeah, Steve, do you want to take that the age that that goes up to, and then further education, etc. Well, if you're talking about the death in service, that's payable regardless of circumstances. It goes to somebody. Uh, and one of the forms that you have on the SPPA's website that I, I advise everybody I speak to pretty much to fill it out um, is a nomination of beneficiaries form. So uh, you know whether you even if you're single, no kids, no immediate family, you know that that lump sum still gets paid. And it would be at the discretion of the trustees. So if you've filled out the form to say who you'd like to get the money, then the trustees clearly in most cases are going to follow your instructions or your wishes um, in the vast majority of cases. So if it's that lump sum they're talking about. Then uh, absolutely, um, it's paid out regardless of whether you've kids or not, partner or not, um, and you can have some influence over where that goes. I'm not sure if that addresses the question because it was kind of breaking up when. Uh, yeah, when yeah I, mean, out. I think the only other thing I'd add to that, Steve, is that there is a proportion of the pension. If your children are still young, up to the age of, um, just remind me again, Steve, up to the age of. It's 23, eight, 23 if they're in full time education or 18 otherwise. Yeah, or in full time education, yeah. Um, generally speaking, there is a proportion. Uh, there's another exception. Portion of your pension. Yep. There is another exception as well. If if you if you have children who are independent, sorry, you have children who are dependent for life because of incapacity. Um, then actually, there's no age limit on when they would benefit as children, if you like. So even you know, well through their life, 
they would still be beneficiaries um, if they're dependent through their own incapacity. So that's that might affect some people who are listening in. Great, thanks guys. Apologies again for my connection. Um, but yeah, um, I think, as I said, there are a couple of questions. Some of them are a bit um, more personal. So um, I think we'll try and get you guys to maybe get back to them individually. Um, yeah, there's and there's a few more come in at the end as well, Kirsty, but we don't have obviously time to answer them all. But one of the ones was, can Wesleyan give financial advice? Yes, I'd like to just reiterate that. Obviously we can. Uh, and you're going to, that's on the, the contact sheet, isn't it, that you're going to put out? Yeah, um, so basically, um, just when we end this today, there'll be um, a short survey just to give us some feedback on um, the session and also just to find out what other webinars you'd be interested in. And then um, either this evening or tomorrow, you should receive a follow up email just thanking you for attending. And that will also include the contact sheet if you do want to get in touch to get some more personalised advice. Um, so yeah, thank you to everyone for attending and, and for keeping with us as we answer the questions. Thank you also for submitting questions um, and thank you to Stephen and Kevin for hosting uh, this evening's webinar as well.